right, good morning. Welcome to the second DataWorks Defense and Aerospace Test and Analysis Workshop. Um, in the fourth iteration of this workshop in its current form, it's uh, my honor to welcome you all here, um, along with my co-host here, Dr. Pete Parker from NASA. Welcome. <laughs> um, this is a very exciting year, because this is the first year that we've sold out this venue in this space for uh, DataWorks. So I um, thank you all for participating in that. Um, and I also would like to highlight how great the program is this year. Um, we've got exciting talks and contributions from across the DOD, but the T&E and the um, program analysis community, NASA, our FFRDCs, in particular Ida, who does so much to put this event on every year, um, our UARC friends, National Ags, Academia, and Industry. It's really a cross-cutting group. And the strength of the program is really due to our technical program committee. So if you are on the technical program committee, I'd like to ask you to stand right now and well, as I tell you about what they do. So our technical program committee, don't be shy, um, they're the ones that are coming up with our invited sessions. They're the ones out there that see a great talk and say, yes, other people need to see this talk. <laughs> and they're apparently shy as well. So thank them for the great program. Uh, a few announcements before we jump into the program. Um, please, all the talk abstracts are online. Please review them so you can make informed selections about what talks you want to go to. Uh, a comment we get every year is there's just too many good talks, which is great. Um, I will not ask the technical program committee to apologize for over-delivering. <laughs> Um, but as a result, we try and make them available online. So after the workshop, all of the talks that we get permission to post will be up there. If you didn't get to see a talk, please go check that out. Um, and you can follow up with the authors. Um, we continue to do a survey to make sure that we're meeting the needs of the attendees of this workshop. So in the, uh, right across the hall there is an interactive um, station where you can pick up a paper survey or fill out one online. And you can also check out testscience.org, where we're sharing a lot of the tools and techniques um, that we're sharing at this workshop. Um, and finally, if you are interested in continuous learning credits or points for attending this, please check in at the registration desk. They have a link and information they can give you for how you get those points awarded. All right. Well, now it's my honor and privilege to introduce Dr. Pete Parker. Um, he's the lead for advanced measurement systems at NASA Langley and serves as an agency-wide statistical expert and advancing statistical methods across all of NASA. He has a BS in mechanical engineering from ODU, an MS in applied physics and computer science from CNU, and a PhD in statistics from Virginia Tech. He is a senior member of AIAA, uh, the American Society for Quality, and the American Statistical Association. And a fun fact, you guys are gonna learn some about <laughs> statistical engineering today. Uh, Pete Parker is the past chair of the statistical engineering as International Statistical Engineering Association, um, which is interesting because it just formed this year. And so somehow he, this is an illustration of how smart this guy is. <laughs> he somehow managed to secure the past chair role without ever having to be chair. So with that, I will turn it over to Pete Parker. Thanks, Laura. <laughs> so it's my privilege to introduce Laura in our collaborative <laughs> talk here. Uh, Dr. Laura Freeman is the Associate Director of Intelligent Systems Lab at the Virginia Tech Hume Center, a new position that she's uh, recently moved into. And her research includes cybersecurity, data analytics, and developing new methods for test and evaluation, focusing on emerging systems technology. Previously, uh, Laura was the Assistant Director of the Operational Evaluation Division at Institute for Defense Analyses. And in that position, she established and developed an interdisciplinary analytical team of statisticians, psychologists, and engineers to advance scientific approaches to DOD test and evaluation. Previously, during 2018, Laura served as the acting senior technical advisor for the director of operational test and evaluation. She has a BS in aerospace engineering, an MS in statistics, and a PhD in statistics from Virginia Tech. Thanks, Pete. So if you haven't caught on yet, what we're going to do today is a collaborative, this is not improv, we rehearsed this, we swear, <laughs> um, but we're doing a, collab <laughs> a collaborative talk about collaboration. Um, and so in that, we want to talk about statistical engineering, how that can benefit your work, but ultimately we want to talk about what it takes to solve the hard problems that the people in this room have to solve on a regular basis. 
So we, one of the things that I think connects this, organi or this group of people and keeps people coming back to DataWorks is that ultimately for a living, we solve hard problems. And so what does it take to solve these hard, large, unstructured problems where there's no textbook solution? You can't go into your Stats 101 textbook and pull out a regression method and say, oh, I've got the answer. Well, it takes a lot more than just the tools. It takes domain knowledge. You have to, from a test and evaluation perspective, my background, you have to understand how the system works. What does, a radar, what does radar do? How do you take the information from that, put it into a command and control system? You need that domain knowledge to then understand how are you gonna go test it? What data do you need to collect? And how are you gonna use that data to turn it into information and ultimately good decisions? Um, so you also need, of course, the data-driven solutions. We need the data collection methodologies, the analysis tools. Um, but we don't wanna do this just one-off. Um, we want sustainable solutions. When we field a system, we wanna know that it's gonna work not just once, but every time, and under what conditions it might struggle, and where we might need to do more training. We need to be able to fully characterize how the system works and do that in a sustainable way so that the people that follow us and you know do the next block of the aircraft or the next version of the software system know what we did before and can leverage that um, and build upon that. Um, so all those things are important in solving these complex problems sustainably. Um, so I wanna take us back a little bit because the world is changing. Um, so it's the semi-automatic ground environment. Um, this is an early, uh, 1957 I think is the date on there, um, networked of systems and arguably maybe the first system where you had data at rest, you had the databases, you had the locations of things, but you also had data in motion, aircraft being tracked by radar that were connected and that those data points were coordinated, is uh, when you read about it in the background, um, what they say. Um, but in that, to, have a, to, to get this picture, they had um, these, these centers that were 22,000 feet, square feet in diameter. And so contrast that with today, where you can, on the back of a Humvee, put a command and control center that not only takes inputs from radars, but different links, it is uh, not just coordinating that data, but correlating and sometimes fusing it together um, in real time. I, I wonder if the, the concept of PSYOP, single integrated air picture metrics, existed back then. Um, what you would be seeing in terms of track latency and how many dual tracks they had and things along those lines. So the technology is changing, it's shrinking, you can take it with you, um, and the implications for that are really, are big. Um, so from an analyst perspective, how is the technology changing? Um, so the former science advisor of uh, operational test and evaluation um, used to tell me about her time at IDA. Um, and when she was analyzing systems, they would hand carry the data back, and then they'd have to go manually enter it in, and then go down to the basement, which is, to, that's how I visualize the basement of IDA, where they were doing their mainframe computing. I know that, <laughs> not really, but, um, and actually write all the code in advance, go down and run it, to actually get the analysis out that they needed. Whereas today, we have this great luxury of, you know, we've, I've got probably 10 devices on me right now. When I go running in the morning, my music automatically starts advertising to me about new running shoes, which I think is slightly terrifying. Um, but we're, we're all connected. We have the ability to bring analysis to ourselves and to the data. We can situate the analytical tools we need um, up in the cloud with our data sets. We can build them in advance. We can share code. One of the things I'm obsessed with is sharing shiny applications. So when someone develops a new methodology, you can just write a wrapper around it, upload it to the internet, and whatever tool that just got developed is deployed. And I don't know, the people that help me with these shiny apps will probably say longer than this, but like within the day. Um, <laughs> so it's very quick. <laughs> um, so the, our world as analysts is changing but also our systems are changing. Um, and this is maybe not the best picture to illustrate it, but this comes from a Defense Science Board report where we're talking about the amount of software in our systems. And so this is the F-35 with its support systems compared to legacy aviation platforms. You see software is growing exponentially, which means that we can change how the system um, processes the information that it's receiving um, just by modifying software. And that's driving new needs for how we think about collecting data, because now we don't just need to know that those a couple dozen or tens of thousands li lines of software work, but we need to know that the whole thing works and that it's secure. Um, and that requires different test techniques than we've used in the past. So the world is changing, and it's starting to accelerate. So here are some of the emerging challenges that we're being faced with in the Department of Defense at NASA 
And I want to highlight one in particular, because um, it really emphasizes the need for this rapid integration between data, the technical domains, and the ability to make decisions with that. And that's hypersonics. Um, so when thinking about hypersonic weapon development or hypersonic defense, a lot of the, th we're not going to have time to support human decision uh, making in real time. We need tools to help us. Um, so lots of systems are starting to look at how do we incorporate machine learning and artificial intelligence into these systems. Um, but that's really a, a, an emerging technology. Um, so the picture there on the bottom is actually from a great, if you're not familiar with how deep learning works, I highly recommend this paper. It's uh, Deep Explore, if you just type that in. It'll pop up and it's kind of a primer on the different methods. But what they're trying to do is develop white box testing methods for it. So the panel on the top, you can see pictures that have not been obfuscated in any way. And all the different algorithms that they look at make the right decision. The car turns and stays on the road. In the paper, they show how darkening or lightening the picture or the image I have there, small little black boxes placed on the image can alter the decision making of that algorithm. And ultimately, that, that's obviously not a desirable outcome, but it can be, you can think about the implications for that from, well, what if we just have a fuzzy sensor to what if someone is purposefully trying to alter these images? How do we know that the system that employs these technologies in real time is gonna make the right decision? Uh, that's a very hard problem and we need to be thinking about how we solve that. When I talk to um, my new friends in academia about this, um, I was actually, you know, this is me, I'm a design of experiments person. So I was asking them, why don't we apply design of experiments and thinking about machine learning optimization and robustness? Um, and the first look I got back was, what's design of experiments? So then you know. I went on a spiel for 30 minutes, but coming back to it, the answer I got from this colleague, who shall remain nameless, was, well, because I'm chasing the next grant, I need the next technology, so I only need this to work once. If it works once, I get to move on, I get to try something new, I get to develop a new technology. The challenge that this community is gonna face is that, well, folks, not everyone in academia is thinking that way, but that is a mentality as you develop new things. But for you all to say, I'm gonna field this, I'm gonna use this, it can't just work once, it has to work every time. And you need to know when it's not gonna work. So with that, I will turn it over to Pete. So Laura's laid out a lot of great challenges. And you know, as I look out into this room, this is a, this is a very unique group of people. Um, I mean that in a good way. I didn't use the word <laughs> odd. Right? Very unique group of people. I mean, there's a broad array of disciplines here we come from different application domains. We come from, uh, we have practitioners here, we have leadership here. This is a really unique forum that to me, I'm always impressed that this is a group of people that don't normally get together. They get in their own specific conferences and discipline areas, but here we're at this intersection. And I think that's the point we want to make that to solve these challenges that Laura's laid out, it's going to require interdisciplinary collaboration. And the term interdisciplinary I use there is a little bit different than multidisciplinary where we're just stacking together or gluing multiple disciplines. But it's really a synergistic combination of both domain knowledge, uh, analytical tools in a way that comes out with a better solution than individually gluing pieces together. It breaks down the barriers. If you were here last year for my keynote, I talked a lot about collaboration. You know, I've got some passion about that. We have a paper now that's um, just appeared in Quality Engineering, and you can see the title of it, uh, Interdisciplinary Collaboration Between Statisticians and Subject Matter Experts. Um, not because I'm the author, but I do think it's a great paper that you should uh, read. And it has six discussants, and I've listed them at the bottom. Interestingly enough, two of those discussants are uh, industrial organizational psychologists working as organizational scientists. So we have not just experience in the paper, but some science behind how that collaboration works. And we're promoting collaboration throughout the project life cycle, um, not just in one specific area, but horizontally from program and, uh, evaluation and analysis, where we think there's some great opportunities there to make uh, a benefit in applying the tools that we have through to developmental tests, to operational tests, and then all the way through to operations. So when we talk about collaboration, we're talking about collaboration among disciplines. We're talking about collaboration horizontally throughout the life cycle. We're also talking about collaboration among organizations.
And so as an example of that, Laura and I decided to share a little bit of our timeline of our collaboration among both NASA, the Director of Operational Tests and Evaluation, and the Institute for Defense Analyses. And that really started off, uh, I think, in earnest around 2011. Uh, 2011, NASA hosted what was called the Statistical Engineering Symposium. At that time, conference was a bad word in the government, so we had a symposium. And uh, <laughs> so we hosted that, and we had about 150 participants from multiple government agencies, and we had very strong support from the T&E community. In fact, our collaboration in the test and evaluation community first started out of Eglin. Uh, Jim Simpson, who I think is here today, was one of those early ones that started that collaboration with us about 2005. And at that meeting, <clears throat> um, we had a lot of good collaboration that was beginning. Um, Dr. Michael Gilmore gave a keynote, previous director of operational test and evaluation at that meeting. So building off of that, um, in 2011, I thought it was 2012, but Pete corrected me, which is why it's important to have collaborators to keep your facts straight. Um, we were, Dr. Gilmore had promoted the use of design of experiments in DOD test and evaluation, and we were trying to figure out what that looked like. We were having lots of committee meetings and coming up with new acro acronyms like STED and other things along those lines. Um, and there was a, just kind of confusion about what this looked like. And so we invited our colleagues, Ray Rue and Pete Parker, from NASA to come up, as well as some of our industry friends, to come talk about what it looked like in their world. And that was a really eye-opening experience for me, because um, it was interesting to see how, when you're in your own organization and you're talking about things, you kind of get sucked into the, the process and the day-to-day. -day. But bringing this outside perspective in really changed the conversation fundamentally. So we went into the workshop talking about, should we do this? Does it, you know, does it make sense? You know, this has not historically been done. And at the end of the workshop, everyone at the table was like, all right, what's the next step? And so that transition that I, I just put up slides and didn't have to do anything. So that's another great advantage of collaboration, is you make your colleagues do all the hard work, um, <laughs> was, was very eye-opening for me. Um, and from that, we, we said, you know, this, this has benefited both of our organizations. It's really helped shape the conversation. Um, so let's talk about building a, an agreement around this and make it broader. Let's not just make it, I call you and I need a favor and you call me. Let's have an agreement that brings in leadership, that has workshops like this, that hosts webinars. And that was the origin of the statistical engineering agreement, which led to the first, no one should ever let me name things, but rigorous test and evaluation, defense, aerospace, and national security, because um, I just keep tagging on names, um, that occurred four years ago. Um, and then expanding our collaboration, we partnered with the Conference on Applied Statistics and Defense, um, which was, has a long history starting as the Army Conference on Design of Experiments and transitioned into the Conference on, on Applied Statistics and Defense ultimately. Partnered with them, um, one of our NASA collaborators and co-chairs, Jonathan Rassam, is much better at naming things and came up with the idea of data, defense and analysis, <laughs> defense and aerospace test and analysis to really emphasize that analysis piece and that we were concerned about the data, and that was the origin of this workshop. So why do we tell you all of that? Well, oh, wait, ah, see, ugh. We're first, working on First club. <laughs> so expanding a little bit more on that interagency agreement, you know, we, we recognize that within NASA and the Department of Defense, we develop some of the world's most complex systems. I just told you all something you already know, right? And out of that, we found these natural synergies to share and rally around the kinds of challenges that we had, both technically and organizationally, to implement new techniques and new ways of doing things, new approaches. And we saw this partnership as a way to uh, serve as a catalyst to bring in other government agencies, academia, industry, and you know, if you look around the room today, there's several government agencies represented here. We have academia, we have industry. That's, that's kind of the vision of this agreement, to say I have a point in which we can rally around these, these similar ideas. There's several key elements to the agreement. One is leadership webinars, which we're, we're due for one. We haven't had one in a little while. Those are virtual webinars. They've been very popular, well attended by both senior leaders in our organization, but also senior in the statistical communities, we've had come and talk about topics like modeling and simulation, Bayesian analysis. Um, tactical practitioner site visits, so that's when we go and share 
back and forth. Lord, Lord just mentioned one of those, and we've had several opportunities to share at each other's organizations in a more informal kind of setting. Um, and that has been very beneficial, encouraging each other and showing some alternative approaches to the techniques that we've had. Uh, I'm personally close to the Navy, to Hakadif, and Dave Bayrot, who's here. We, we've had uh, we had a couple meetings over there, sharing back and forth on ideas that we've had. So we took advantage of that close proximity of where I'm located at, at Langley. And then, of course, the central element is the workshop, as Lord has said. DataWorks came out of this agreement. And finally, we in, intend to have more joint publications. I think we've had an, an IT publication after the first workshop, but that's something that we, we think that will provide more strength to the community if we do these joint publications, sharing on our challenges. So why do we tell you all these things? So why are you guys here? Well, of course, you're here to learn about the cool techniques and tools um, that the, the co-chairs scoped out in the program, these verification and validation and accreditation of models, data integration, sequential testing, how we start to think about artificial intelligence and autonomy, um, data curation, how we do data management, and cybersecurity and human systems integration. Those are all very important topics, and you're going to learn about tools and methods that support those. Um, shameless plug. Ida just published a wonderful document on statistical methods for ver verification and validation, which is available on testscience.org, and you can go out there and look at it. And all of the authors of that handbook would love it if you read it and <laughs> enjoyed it, because it, it was a process. Um, but it's not just about that. So I would challenge you, as you're here, to think about how do you build on this theme of collaboration. So yes, come learn about tools, learn, see case studies of how people have implemented these things, but when you see a good talk, don't let it stop with you. Go talk to that person, invite them back to your organization, bring these things back to the leaders in your organization, because that's how we're going to really start to change the way that these methods and tools and how we solve problems in each of our own organizations, and will lead to better um, problem solving ultimately. So bring, bring the things that you learn here back, and build your own little collaborations, and then bring all those collaborations back to DataWorks next year. All right, so we've talked a lot here in the last few slides about statistical engineering, and I'm going to guess there's probably some people out there wondering, what is statistical engineering? So we thought we'd put a few slides in and just give a clear definition of what we mean when we use that term. Um, the two takeaways, if you had to describe it for me, is that it's an engineering discipline, and I'll explain that more as to why I say that. And second, that it's application-focused. It starts with the application, not the data, not tools, it's not focused on the solutions, it's focused on the applications. It has three characteristics of solutions that come from statistical engineering. One is it's highly collaboratory, collaborative, uh, interdisciplinary collaboration. It, it, it's a type of problems that you can't solve sitting in your cubicle by yourself. I, I once had a branch manager said, if you're working on things that you can solve sitting at your desk, then you're not working on what I want you to work on. It requires dependence on other subject matter domains and working together. The second is that it's a combination of multiple tools. It's not one thing. I know design of experiments is a topic that both Laura and I have uh, spent a lot of time in and expertise, and that's a topic here. But it's, it's not just that tool. It's combinations of tools, analytical tools and methods. And often they require extension. Often they're not sufficient the way they are to apply to that application. And third is that the solutions are sustainable. They become embedded in the systems. They're not one-off solutions. They change the way we do business. They change the way we operate or test or run that system. Those are the most powerful, the replication of that benefit over and over again instead of a one-off solution. Well, you know, motivations, why to apply? I mean, I, I think all of these are, are motivations that everybody would agree to. You know, it, it, we want to efficiently gain knowledge. From the NASA perspective, we're not turning a profit this year. We're not running a business. We are in the business of generating knowledge as efficiently as possible. And in test and evaluation, you have answers and decisions to make about systems, and you want to do that as efficiently and as quickly as possible in a rigorous way. The second is that it ensures these strategic resource investment. How much should we spending be spending to make that decision, to gain that information? Is there a quantitative way to do that, or is it just a gut feel? This is how many tests we need to run. And our tests in our community 
are very expensive. It's not the simple laboratory test in a university where a grad student can run over and over and over again. These are very expensive full up tests. And so that resource investment being matched to the questions the plot that we have to answer is ex extremely important and statistical engineering provides a way to, to make that link. And lastly, it supports decisions. I mean, we, we all are in the business of making some kind of decisions, adequacy of test systems, safety, reliability, performance, those are all decisions. And we want those decisions to be risk-informed, data-driven uh, decisions. Those are the key elements. One click. So an engineering discipline, Roger Hurl, formerly from GE, and Ron Snee, formerly from DuPont, wrote a series of articles about 2010. And uh, to me, it was really enlightening how they just took the English definition of the term engineering. What is engineering? It's the practical application of pure sciences for the benefit of society, to make a change, to affect, to build systems. I mean, I can tell you from my own experience, my undergraduate degree is mechanical engineering. I would say I learned everything I needed to know about mechanical engineering in like physics and calculus and chemistry and computer science, but I couldn't build anything. It wasn't until I took statics and dynamics and thermodynamics and strength of materials and you know, heat and mass transfer. Those are the things where you now have the ability to put together those fundamental sciences and build a system. Much the same way, applying that same English definition of statistical engineering, it's the engineering of pure statistical sciences to generate solutions, solution approaches, strategies of how to solve problems. And when we use the term statistical sciences there, I want to kind of just make a comment that that's much broader than what you, you might think of traditional statistics. It's anything that involves information, data-driven solutions, information technology-rich solutions. It's a, broad, it's a broad umbrella that we're trying to, to paint there. So, Statistical engineering is application focused. It starts with fundamental questions. It doesn't start with data. And uh, we, we've uh, adopted sort of a, a, a series of questions similar to the Haumeier questions, if you're familiar with those, which he used to launch a successful research project to curb enthusiasm and to manage de demands of the project manager. So oftentimes when I get on a project, I have somebody say something like, I need to build this test article, I need to run this test, and I need to get data. It's something of that flavor. And I say, no, you don't. And they look at me sort of puzzled. So what you need to do is you need to learn. You need to make a decision about something. You need to either confirm what you think you already know or discover something new. And yes, data might be a requirement to make that decision, but the right data is driven by the precise right questions. And so I start off asking, what is it we need to learn? Instead of a list of things we need to do, I start with a list of things we need to know, things we need to learn, questions we need to answer. And once we kind of make that shift, then the question comes, well, how will we know when we're done? How will we know when we've learned enough? And that requires quantitative, measurable, detectable metrics. You know, when to say, when do we can declare success? That naturally leads to the next question. Well, depending on the context, how well do we need to know the answers? You know, I've worked on everything from human spaceflight, where loss of crew is important, is the important metric there, the probability of that, to early development in very small, inexpensive wind tunnels. And, you know, nobody wants to be wrong about their experimental data or the inferences they make, but uh, there is a different man, uh, uh, management of risk and different management of resources depending on how well you need to know. So, you know, what are the consequences if you're wrong? What will it impact? Who will it impact? And then that naturally leads to the questions about resource investment. And are the resources that we have allocated, are they justifiable based on what we need to know and how well we need to know and the consequences of being wrong? You know, I didn't say anything in that whole slide about tools. I didn't say anything about how we're going to solve the problem. It's framing the problem in a very precise way which leads to an efficient solution where we bring in whatever tools are the right tools for the job. So to illustrate this, we're going to have a, a short NASA example and I have a video here that we hope will play and then I'll explain it in just a minute.
In the Utah desert, engineers are getting ready to set off some fireworks tonight. Major fireworks. They're going to test the world's largest solid rocket motor as it lies on its side. It's bolted down. It's mounted in such a way that when you fire the motor, it's not going anywhere. It's bolted down really well because this solid rocket motor is so powerful, it would win a tug of war with two dozen jumbo jets going full throttle. The engineers here have tested rocket motors this way many times. 46 times, in fact. So they can measure the motor's performance in ways that would be impossible in an actual flight. And if this motor seems familiar, we have booster ignition. And that's because two of them are used to launch the space shuttle. At four times the speed of sound, they drop away as the shuttle's main engines kick in. Good uh, solid rocket booster separation. Later, they're recovered and reused. The motors have been used on over 100 shuttle missions. So why test them again? Why test them again? I thought that was a good way to end for this community. Why <laughs> do another test? Well, this particular solid rocket motor, there we go, was going to be leveraged in a new space architecture. It was going to be taken off the side of the shuttle and used in a single stick configuration. And by doing that, obviously there's benefits in leveraging heritage architecture, but in a completely new application, it had new performance metrics that had to be defined. Performance metrics that provide that that were uh, deemed to be a very high technical and programmatic risk, and capability capability of the vehicle was at jeopardy based on how well we define these new performance metrics, ones that were never uh, defined during the shuttle era. Um, so that involved a series of static firing, where you saw the video clip there uh, at at uh, ATK Thiokol in Utah and then a flight test of the Ares 1X rocket that took place. I'm not going to spend time talking about the details of what we did here. I'm happy to talk to somebody in, in, uh, afterwards about that. But what I want to emphasize in this case study is it required collaboration, and it required extension of methods. And quite frankly, when we faced this problem, it was one of the biggest problems we had seen. This was uh, an in independent engineering oversight that was set up through the NASA Engineering Safety Center. That's an organization that came out after the loss of the Columbia. The Columbia Accident Investigation Board set up this independent organization that performed engineering oversight, not programmatic or scheduled. And so their motto is engineering excellence. And rigor and defendability of the results are the critical components of all of their assessments. This was one of their first assessments. And in fact, interestingly enough, there's several of us in the room, Ray Rue, Jeff Vining, Laura herself, all worked on this over the years of about five years to change the way in which that testing was done, to get the answers with quantified uncertainty, to provide training, um, all of the things that are required to have a sustainable solution. I think this is an excellent example of when we talk about statistical engineering, and Laura mentioned this earlier, there's no textbook solution for this problem. And you think, well, okay, that's obvious. There's many problems that we have like that. Let me go a little further. There's no textbook strategy for an approach to solve this problem. And what we saw from our experience is that's a huge gap in training of people with analytical skills, particularly statisticians, when they come out when faced with these kinds of problems that don't fit and conform to textbook solutions. It's a gap. Furthermore, I'll go further, there's a gap not only in training, but in the expectation of management and leadership of the role that a statistician can play, a leadership role to integrate multiple disciplines and solve high impact problems. So to address those gaps that um, Pete has raised, um, I'm happy to announce that an International Statistical Engineering Association has been formed. So this is an opportunity for you guys to expand your networks even more. Um, and I think it's very interesting, Jeff Bining is the current chair, and um, when he talks about this association and the motivations for it, he always talks about you guys. The reason that this was necessary is that this community motivated the fact that we need an organization to promote the development of curriculum in the analytical community so that analysts are equipped to come solve these problems, that they have strategies. Pete talked about how in engineering, deforms, dynamics, statics, those are the courses that start to bring together the different methods so that you have strategies that's lacking from the analytical 
um, background. And so this uh, organization is devoted to advancing the promotion of statistical engineering, but also filling that gap, coming up with curriculum. Um, Jeff hosted the first webinar yesterday, so there'll be resources for you guys um, that are available, um, and it's free to join, which is awesome. Um, so we have little flyers if you're interested in more information, but wanted to make you aware of that opportunity. Um, and I'll end by highlighting the quote at the end there. Um, a very smart person that I know, and also another very smart person, that was our first statistical engineering keyword keynote back four years ago, Christine Anderson Cook, um, made this prediction. And so um, I, I think they're on the right track. And we'll, we'll test it in a couple more years to see if your hypothesis holds up. And so with that, you can wrap us up. So our challenge to you, I guess first of all, keep coming to DataWorks. Um, this is a really unique venue, and we want to make it better. We want to encourage the type of interdisciplinary types of discussions and collaboration that happens within this venue. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it, it's you, the people that come, that make this, this event a success, right? Um, this is not something we can orchestrate. This is a venue that we provide, and we're excited to see the synergistic kind of benefits that are getting across seeing other people's applications. You know, that's what's interesting here from my experience, for example, in aerospace, you tend to be in a very specific area where you see the applications that you work in. You know, I think it's great to see test and evaluation of, you know, rocket systems that are not carrying human space flight, you know, not carrying humans. I think those types of uh, uh, examples have so much obvious crossover, and uh, we all learn from those, sharing across them. Um, you know, we want you to, to share your experiences. So come next year or now while you're here and share your experiences with others about both the challenges and the, and the benefits that you've, that you've seen. Um, the second bullet there I just want to park on, park on for a minute, uh, engaging leadership. I, I suspect there are a lot of people here that feel that they are maybe undervalued, underappreciated by their organization. They've got some great tools, but status quo is ruling the day. And so I can tell you, and Laura would echo this as well, we've been there. And the key about engaging leadership, or one key I'll, I'll give you, is to listen carefully when they, dis, dis, when they discuss or, dis, or talk about the problems that they have. Listen analytically to that. Now, that's the problems that they have, not the problems you think they should be solving. And then think about solutions. And I can tell you, if you come up with solutions to the problems that they think they have and the ones that they articulate, then they'll come looking for you. So that's my encouragement about engaging leadership. Um, the next section is about, you know, as Laura talked about, bringing it back to your organization, not just the tools, but the stories you've had. And, and to reemphasize, invite somebody to come give a talk. Uh, from another organization. Laura and I have, have really greatly benefited from that, of mutually sharing it, it's each other's organizations and other members of our teams doing that. It's, it's just a, a great opportunity to have somebody come in from the outside and share their stories. So I encourage you to, you know, if you hear a talk today or tomorrow and it's really good, talk about, you know, go up and see if you can invite that person to come speak at your organization. It, it's, a, it's a great way to expand the knowledge that's presented for those who are not here. And lastly, we talked about joining uh, the International Statistical Engineering Association, uh, Association. Membership is free for individuals, so this is a low-risk prop proposition to you, um, but hopefully very high value. And uh, keep a lookout for information that will be on the website about meetings, publications, webinars. Uh, Jeff, gave a, uh, Jeff Vining gave a webinar yesterday. Um, so, Keep a lookout on that. And the annual summit is going to be held this year in September right here locally in Gaithersburg. So if you're interested in attending that and participating in that, it'll be held at NIST. Um, it's a great venue to, to see the broader picture of statistical engineering and the different activities that are going on, particularly in training, program, curriculum development. And that's both academic and professional training, so not just in the academic arena. I think our takeaway from all of this, and we hope this talk has been inspiring, maybe challenging, is that our potential contributions, both in leadership 
and in the, the tools and capabilities that we have combined with the discipline expertise is just tremendous. And uh, we think it's clear. And we think that those potential contributions and potential benefits are unlimited. And so with that, we hope you have a great two days. And we thank you for your attention.